All right. Okay. So um, I'm just going to say a few words by way of introduction for, about our speaker tonight, and then we'll begin the program. So first I want to welcome everyone. My name is Amy Janess. I'm programming coordinator at the Nantucket Athenaeum, which is the uh, public library on the island of Nantucket. And this evening, we're really happy to welcome historian and best-selling author Patrick K. O'Donnell. He's written 12 critically acclaimed books that recount the epic stories of America's wars from the American Revolution to Iraq. He's the premier expert on elite and special operation units and irregular warfare. And Patrick is also a fellow at the Fred W. Smith Library for the study of George Washington at Mount Vernon in Virginia. O'Donnell not only writes about combat, but he's experienced it firsthand. During the Iraq war, he was embedded with military units as the only civilian combat historian to volunteer and spend three months in Iraq documenting the experiences of troops in battle and fought with a Marine rifle platoon. He did a second tour in Iraq and served as war correspondent for Men's Journal and Fox News. And he's written for Military History Quarterly and World War II Magazine, and is a frequent contributor to the National Review. So please join me in welcoming Patrick K. O'Donnell. Thank you very much. It's really a, a pleasure and an honor to be here tonight. And thank you everyone for joining. Um, every book that I've written is a journey. I've uh, enjoyed this journey for really 30 years. Um, I, I started interviewing World War II veterans right out of college. And that was uh, when nobody else was doing it. And I, I gathered oral histories uh, from the elite units, the Airborne and the Rangers. And that mushroomed into a website called thedropzone.org. People said to me, why don't you write a book? And that began the other part of this journey, which is my 12th book tonight. And each one of the books I've ever written has found me in one way or another. It's, for instance, I wrote a book called Washington's Immortals, where I made a battle, I went on a battlefield tour with the battalion commander I was with in, in Fallujah, and we found a rusted old sign that said, here lie 256 Continental Soldiers, Maryland Heroes. And I wanted to know, you know, the backstory behind that sign. Who were these men? It's much like the Indispensables. The story found me through the, the readers that I have, as well as through Washington's Immortals. The, the stories have a bit of a, some overlap, a tiny overlap, because it was the indispensables or the Maryl the Marbleheaders that transported the, Mar the, the Marylanders who made an epic stand in the Battle of Brooklyn. And it's really, I ask a very simple question before I write any of the books I've, I've, ever, can, I've ever written is, it's, it's why, who, what is it, who cares? Why does it matter? With the indispensables, they were indispensable to our country. We would not be here, at least in this format, as a, as a country had it not been for the individuals I've written about in this book. It's a very special group. It's not only about the regiment, but it's also about the central figures in Marblehead at, at the time, which as you know, is roughly 16 miles north of Boston. But during the 1600s, Marblehead was the second largest city in, thriving metropolis next to Boston. And fortunes were made on cod fishing and trading. And it's there that the, uh, the book begins. The opening scene of this book is on a, um, is on a, a, on a ship called the, the Pit Packet. And the Pit Packet was returning back to Marblehead. And the sailors on board that ship thought that they were going home to their loved ones until they were intercepted by the Royal Navy. And the Royal Navy, they were there not to, to greet the Marbleheaders, but to basically bring them into slavery, to impress them. And at this time, this, is, this was very common. The Royal Navy was very short of experienced sailors. They just didn't have enough to man the hundreds of ships that they had that were 
they were circling the globe and they needed more, they needed bodies. So they went aboard the pit packet with, with, with uh, weapons in hand and at gunpoint, they told the men of the pit packet that they were coming aboard and they were gonna now be members of the Royal Navy. And it didn't matter if they had families or anything else. They were now members of the Royal uh, Navy and they'd be paid a pittance and it was life service. Most of the men that were impressed would never go home. In fact, they'd die aboard ship and they'd never be heard from or seen again in most cases. But the crew of the pit packet decided to resist. And this resistance is emblematic of Marblehead at the time. They, they were being interfered with constantly by the crown with impressment, with uh, undue regulations, with taxation, et cetera. And uh, they decided to resist. And it's really quite a dramatic scene. The opening scene of this book is based on court documents. So they're, they're transcripts, but they're, they're very vivid and, and detailed. And what happens is they board the ship, a bag of salt falls across the deck, and Michael Corbett, who's one of the main characters in the book, draws a line in the, in, this, in the salt with his foot. It says, if you cross that line, you're a dead man. And the, the, the British officer that was in charge of the boarding party took a, a whiff of snuff and ignored the command and crossed the line. And at that point, his, uh, he was met with a, a harpoon right to the throat in his carotid artery, and he bled out. And, you know, that's where the story begins. And it's America's first super lawyer, John Adams, that gets Michael Corbett off for the charge of murder. But this causes a sensation. And it's just one um, incident of many, many incidents that bring us to eventually independence. But it's a long road. And it a mainspring of the revolution happens to be through Marblehead for a variety of reasons, not only because of its great wealth, but it's also an intellectual mainspring in many ways of ideas for the early revolution, as well as a power center. Some of the most powerful men come from Marblehead, but it's very unique as a community. It's very cosmopolitan and it's progressive for the time. Um, with, as I get further into this, this, uh, this meeting, I'll talk to, to you about how it's, it's a diverse regiment, which consists of African-Americans, free African-Americans, Native Americans, some, even some Hispanics that fight side by side and form arguably the greatest fighting regiment in American history. And this interference continues after the, the Pitt Packet incident. The Boston Massacre is a central theme in the book, as well as the community, which continues to incite um, the Americans. They realize that their, their safety is in jeopardy. And one of the key characters in this book, this book is, revolves around several doctors that are very close friends. The book is written in a narrative fashion. It's a... Um, sort of a band of brothers, if you will, history. It's not dry, it's very narrative driven, but it's got over a thousand endnotes that are drawn from primary sources, letters, diaries, pension files, et cetera, to give you in their own words, in many cases what they saw and did. And um, the Boston massacre occurs, Crispus Attucks, uh, an African-American is killed. And his autopsy is performed by one of the main characters in this book, Dr. Benjamin Church. Dr. Church is really a remarkable individual. He's extremely well-trained, undergraduate at Harvard, goes overseas to get his medical training. Quite an extraordinary character a, um, that's, that's skilled in many things. But Dr. Church has a dark side, and his mistress resides in marble one of many. And there's a connection to the town through that lady, but also through his, his friendship with um, Dr. Joseph Warren, who's a key 
member of the resistance at the time and would later become president of the, the provincial Massachusetts government and a, the key, one of the key ringleaders of the Patriot movement, along with an obscure figure that I bring out really for the first time, um, Dr. Nathaniel Bond. These three men are all very close friends. And Dr. Bond and Dr. Warren have an interesting connection too. They're resurrectionists, they're body snatchers. There is no professional service that provides bodies for the 18th century. And these men want to understand the science of anatomy. So in the dead of night, they dig up bodies and um, they remove cadavers for the study of science. And it's part of one of their, they, they're part of a club that actually does this. And it's one of the unique and interesting connections within the book in this dynamic relationship between these three individuals. Uh, moving forward, there's um, you know, a series of things occur that are, that are very dramatic. The, um, the Boston Tea Party takes place, which includes many members of Marblehead. It's the, that the, they're, they're in many cases the mainsprings within that, within the movement which causes all kinds of effects. It causes um, the Port of Boston to be shut down, something called the Intolerable Acts. And really it's collective punishment on everybody for, for putting the tea in the harbor, which is looked at as an act of terrorism by the Crown. And um, you know, one thing leads to another. Judges are removed, only Crown officials are now in their place. The port's closed, which causes you know, upwards of five, 6,000 men and women to be out of work and have no means of employment. People are starving. Um, there's something else called the Fisheries Act, which takes place, which denies the Marbleheaders their main source of revenue and income, the grand banks. And fortunes are made on cod. Cod fishing is huge in Marblehead. The boats go out, they sail, you know, well over a thousand miles to the Grand Banks outside of Nova Scotia, and they fish. And the fish are massive. I mean, over a hundred pounds in many cases. And this breeds very hard individuals. It also breeds a unique set of a skill set, a teamwork of individuals working together. Race doesn't matter on, on a boat when, um, you know, literally 10 foot waves are about to envelop the boat in life and death uh, circumstances and decisions have to be made. You rely on the person next to you. So there's an incredible amount of teamwork that takes place um, on these fishing boats. And that will later translate on what happens on the battlefield. But as this government interference is taking place, another thing that's very interesting and unique takes place. Not only do the men of Marblehead bring back cod fishing, and they also bring back trade goods from the rest of the world, but they bring back a deadly virus. And this virus hits Marblehead very hard in the middle of 1773, 74. And it divides the town politically. Um, the virus has a profound impact on the town. And the Patriots come up with a very unique and novel solution. They decide to create a vaccination or a inoculation hospital and this was cutting edge science for the time. It's, uh, this is before Jenner came up with the vaccine and, and understood how smallpox, a, a very deadly virus and very contagious virus, how that actually um, affects the body and how it, it, it transmits. But they realized that quarantine was, was one means of, of dealing with it, but inoculation was another, and this was dangerous business. Inoculation involved taking a small knife and lancing the top of somebody's shoulder with a tiny portion of the virus and hoping that the virus would, you just get a low dose of the virus and then you basically would be able to, to, to deal with or fight the virus. And in most cases it worked. In other cases it didn't work and 
people could die or were in some cases very horribly disfigured. It, this, the, smallpox is horrendous. It would cause pustules all over the face and body that were, um, you know, very pain, painful store, sores that caused scarring. And it was highly contagious. So the inoculation hospital they felt was the, the solution. And a primary individual behind the inoculation hospital was one of the main characters of the indispensables, really an unknown um, at member of the American Revolution is, that had been lost to history um, until I wrote the indispensables, Dr. Nathaniel Bond. And Dr. Bond, as I mentioned earlier, was very close friend with J J Joseph Warren. Um, another very important member of this book is Elbridge Gerry. I think another sort of forgotten founding far, uh, founder who um, many of his ideas of liberty and freedom will be imbued in the Amer early American Revolution as well as the Constitution, which comes later. But they're all very closely related and Bond tries to solve the virus problem with the inoculation hospital. That does not sit well with the loyalist members of the town. The book is, I take, I try to be very even handed in my treatment of all of the individuals in the book and sort of let them tell the story through their own words. And that includes the loyalists who are really quite exceptional in their own way. Um, and, uh, you know, dealing with, with massive amounts of change in terms of the ideas that are coming about of freedom and liberty and the changing of the order. And none of this sits well with them. And they oppose the inoculation hospital, not only in the town meetings, but then they covertly organize a raid in the dead of night and they burn the hospital to the ground with everyone inside it. Um, Remarkably, nobody dies, including women and children. But the hospitals burn to the ground, and the Patriots now face a loss of 2,000 pounds out of their own pocket, which is a, a small fortune for the time. And they go through the authorities to round up the individuals that did this uh, barbarous act, and they arrest them. They're brought to the local jail, and the loyalists then incite the mob. And uh, the mob then goes rampant in Marblehead. And with, you know, the, the Essex Gazette has some amazing scenes of with, with crowbars and axes, hundreds, thousands of people literally storm the jail, break open the doors and free the individuals. And it's done in a celebratory manner, fife and drum, they're marching. And then they surround the houses of the Patriots. And it's a, uh, to, they're there to kill them potentially. The houses are surrounded. Um, a main character in my book is a, a captain known as John Glover, who's a extraordinary merchant, a man that had literally gone, came from nothing. He was a self-made man that, that was initially a cobbler. Uh, made shoes, fishermen, and over time built up money to build a bar, extremely successful. And then he has, he buys his first ship and then it's one of many ships and he's trading and everything else. But he's an ardent patriot and a funder of the hospital. His own daughter is, is, becomes, um, is inoculated. Uh, they, they treat her um, at the hospital. And um, his home is surrounded that night. And John Glover has a novel and interesting solution. He takes a four pound cannon and wheels it into the foyer of his home. And when the mob shows up on his front lawn, the doors are thrust open and John Glover has a lighted torch in hand and it orders the mob to disperse. And the effective persuasion of the four pounder works, the crowd disperses, but that is a sort of a demonstration of the tenacity of one of these, the characters in my book. And the, the loyalists, you know, have a victory 
with these with smallpox. It's they use the virus to politically divide the town and gain power. And um, it's it's the, it's actually the board, the intolerable acts that shift the power back to the patriots because people see that their livelihoods are destroyed by the crown and they line up behind the patriot cause. And the, the press is behind, for the most part, behind the Patriot cause. And, um, you know, things continue to change. There's a political revolution that is taking place in Massachusetts in 1774. And the zeitgeist, the mood of the country is one of revolution and change. Freedom and liberty, uh, John Locke, other things that are sort of these are very unique and new ideas for the time. And that is the mood of the country. And, and, and there's also what's going on next is, um, is the crown is tightening the screws economically in different ways. And the entire event changes overnight though. When General Gage decides to try to disarm the Americans at the Somerville uh, Powder House. And he conducts a brilliant raid of over 200 men. They go in boats from the castle, which is sort of the location of the British main headquarters in Boston Harbor. They come out from there in the dead of night, they attack the Somerville um, Powder Magazine, which contains hundreds of barrels of powder. And instantly, um, everything changes. A rumor crops up that six Amer Americans were killed during the raid. Turns out to be false, but they don't know that at the time. They do know that their powder has been taken. And this is a series of steps by the Crown to disarm the Americans. And the reason why this is very important is Americans had weapons, but they didn't have any gunpowder. And if you don't have any gunpowder, the weapons are useless. And the crown knew that. And all of their prior revolutions or dealing with unrest, they were very effective on in, in disarming any insurrectionists, if you will. So they went after the powder supply. And the Americans knew this. And there was a massive uh, crowd that formed um, in, uh, in and around Boston shortly after the raid. And rumors were swirling that people had been executed or killed during the raid. And it was getting very violent. There was, there was I mean, it, it was turning that way. But the Patriot leaders were able to sort of quell the crowd. Joseph Warren emerges from the shadows and has this great speech and tells people to be nonviolent to calm them. Even refreshments are served. And um, a storm comes in and it, it dissipates the crowd. But the, the revolution, political revolution of 1774-73, which has a, a major component of it forming from Boston as well as Marblehead, is now changing. There's an arms race. And General Gage is given instructions to crush the Americans with brute force by rounding up the ringleaders and then completely in any way possible also disarming them. And he then conducts a series of surgical raids, at least that's the plan, to remove the powder supplies. Meanwhile, all of that powder or the bulk of it is coming through Marblehead or from the Marbleheaders. They have crucial relationships with the main trading family in Spain. And the King of Spain is sympathetic even before the revolution begins and powder, guns, small arms are coming through Spain. Our first foreign aid is coming from Spain. And this is sort of an unknown aspect of the American Revolution, but the powder and supplies are coming from Spain. The Americans are realizing that if they don't arm themselves, they will be 
their, their lives are in danger. And, and Gage is, is, is instructed to crush the rebellion with brute force. And he's now waiting for reinforcements to arrive to do that. But he's also buying time, but then trying to conduct surgical raids, potentially, eventually also get ringleaders within the Revolutionary War movement. And this is very fascinating. Town is divided politically. One of my main characters is a loyalist, King Hooper, and he is Gage's best friend. Gage actually stays in Hooper's summer residence, which is a little bit further away from Marblehead, but that's where he lives. And they're very closely, they're very tightly, um, tightly, very tight friendship. And within, as this is going on, Massachusetts forms a a provincial government after it's disbanded, after the original uh, government is disbanded by General Gage. All of the main committees are, are, cha- are chaired or spearheaded by Marbleheaders. The Committee of Supplies, Committee of Safety, Marbleheaders are there. They are the key to the Massachusetts provincial government and um, play a leading role in bringing in the supplies as well as directing, you know, what's gonna happen next. And, you know, a series of raids by General Gage um, nearly tip the revolution over into full-blown war. At Salem, there's an incredible story of how Gage launches another raid to seize cannon and, and powder. Quite humorous in many ways, though. But they land, and uh, it's on a Sunday when you know people are at church, and they make their way from Marblehead to Salem, and they're halted at a bridge, and they raise the Patriots raise the bridge, and literally thousands of Americans descend on a small force of about over two hundred British regulars, and they're. Violence could easily erupt at any moment. And it's interesting, a, a, um, a reverend comes up with a novel solution. The, the colonel in, in charge of the unit says he must cross the bridge to conduct his mission. They come up with a, a, a compromise. They say, you can cross the bridge, but then you, can, you must, as soon as you cross the bridge, you cross back over the bridge and go back to your boat. You don't have, you're not allowed to go search for any cannon or powder. And they agree to it and they cross the bridge and they come back and they leave um, to the great, uh, you know, it's a very humorous situation. There is a lot of insults that are hurled. Even one individual is pricked with a bayonet, Um, but the war doesn't start there. It starts a little bit further down only weeks later at Lexington and Concord. And it's the, the marble headers that are, once again, behind the buildup of supplies that General Gage is attempting to seize. And um, it's quite interesting. It's one of America's first and greatest traitors, Dr. Benjamin Church, that informs General Gage exactly where everything is located. So they know where the supplies are located, where the powder is located, they know who the ringleaders are. Dr. Church even informs Gage on how the Americans are going to fight and how to deal with the Americans. He is Gage's super spy, and he is right at the heart of the Patriot leadership. And um, that dynamic and interaction is, is brought out in the book. It's the marbleheaders that are, that are behind the a bulk of the powder that's in, the, in that supply. And they, they, they later also fight during the battle itself. And um, they battle the British as they, they make their way back towards Boston. And it's really here that there's very, a very interesting dynamic, a very interesting scene occurs. I have a four page letter that I own the original copy from. It's a desperate letter from Dr. Bond to Elbridge Gary. And Dr. Bond, was, was there at Lexington and Concord. And he would later, um, he was, we've, quite possibly he was fighting, but he also treated 
the soldiers or those that were combatants from both sides. He was following his Hippocratic Oath. And for that, especially for treating the British soldiers, he was branded a loyalist and a traitor. He was canceled. And Dr. Bond's house was surrounded by a mob of patriots who believed that he was loyal to the crown and had betrayed them. And the letter that I have, this four page letter, is a desperate plea from Dr. Bond to Eldridge Gary demanding that they send an armed guard because he says there are thousands of people that are trying to kill him. And they bring the armed guard out and he goes under oath in a court martial in front of Joseph Warren, Dr. Church, as well as other members of the Patriot leadership and explains what happened and is exonerated for, you know, obviously something he was just doing his duty. Um, and it, what, what's fascinating here is a man that was canceled, a man that was, you know, shamed and humiliated for something, for just doing his, his duty to protect people as a doctor, instead of being upset, decides to continue the Patriot cause. I find this fascinating. His honor was besmirched, but he continued to fight on and he would become the fighting surgeon within the Marblehead Regiment. And this regiment would fight through the entire first two years of the war. And they were in all the crucial inflection points of the, of the war. And literally their operations, the things that they had done at the American Dunkirk, for instance, they would row Washington's army across the East River and save it from annihilation at the Battle of Brooklyn. Dr. Bond was in the boat. I mean, this is a situation where a, a fog miraculously sets in at dawn and screens the movement of, the, of nearly 10,000 Americans. It's the boats that are, that are crewed and manned by the Marbleheaders that bring them safely across. It was mission impossible that night. Only the most skilled mariners in the, in the colonies could have pulled it off and they were there and they did it. But that was just the first of many examples. Later on, it would be the Marbleheaders that would bring the army. Well, first they would, at the Battle of Pelham Bay or Pell's Point, the army was about to be flanked by an amphibious landing. They stopped the landing first at Throng's Neck and then they stopped the landing at Pell's Point and have a collapsible defense which allows Washington's army to escape to the safety of White Plains. They even play a, a key role in that battle. Um, but the greatest moment where Dr. Bond was saving lives in all of these incidents, by the way, he was also leading a company of Marbleheaders. He was a company commander in the thick of battle, giving commands, leading from the front. That's the way most of these guys did it in the 18th century and fighting on. Remarkably, a man whose honor was besmirched, fighting on, continues. And it's at the Battle of Trenton that the Marbleheaders have perhaps their finest hour. The battle, the, the entire war hinges on Trenton. The enlistments for the army are expiring. Washington's army, which was 20,000 strong, diminishes to thousands of men. By the end of December, the enlistments are gonna expire for the whole army. As Washington writes, the game is nearly up. He, strike, he stakes everything on a bold move to take out the, the Hessian garrison at Trenton. He needs to get across the Delaware River. And he asks John Glover if he can do it. The river is very uh, treacherous. That night, on Christmas night, it's swirling. It's a... The, um, the currents, everything, there's ice, there's a nor'easter, it's mission impossible. Don't worry, General, my lads can handle it. That's what he says. His la lads did handle it. Every other attempt by the army that night failed. They couldn't cross. Only the Marbleheaders got across in their boats. 
They were the only ones that made it across that night. They cross Dr. Bond, along with Glover and his son. Many others are in the, the, the main attack and they're, they're part of Sullivan's division, which is going down the river road, which, which basically parallels the Delaware River. They're behind schedule. Dawn is coming very soon. And without orders, the Marbleheader sees probably the most important real estate in North America at the time, the Aston Peak Creek Bridge. And why is this important? Because it's the only escape route that Yoran Rawl has to get away that night and or that day. And they seize the bridge, they put cannon on the high ground. And the Battle of Trenton is a decisive American victory. Had it not been for that decisive, most battles in the 18th century, the armies fight. Once one side has an advantage over the other, that other the other side that's being that doesn't have the advantage retreats and they leave the field. This was a double envelopment. The entire regiment, most of the entire regiment was destroyed or captured and along with their guns. And it changes immediately the zeitgeist, the mood of the country, one of defeat, one defeat after another, after the Battle of Brooklyn, after, after White Plains, after all the other massive, after Fort Washington debacles, there is a victory. It's one of several victories in the 10 crucial days that changed the course of world history and the American Revolution. It's the Marbleheaders that facilitate it. And a week later, the Marbleheaders, their enlistments expire along with the rest of the army. And this is a crucial time. It's, it's melting away even worse than, uh, you know, before Trent. And Washington musters all of his oratory skills to beg and plead for individuals to volunteer and stay a little bit longer. Many of the Marblehead men go home. Their wives are done. John Glover's wife is on her deathbed. The town is bankrupt. Many go home, but many stay. One of those men that stayed was Dr. Bond, company commander. He stays on along with other key members of the Marblehead Regiment. Many of the men that stay on would die in the subsequent battles, or they would die to an invisible enemy that was now attacking the army. Smallpox, the virus, is is, is killing more Americans than British bullets. And it's a marble header that saves the army. Washington calls upon the expert on viruses, Dr. Bond, to inoculate the entire Continental Army by setting up a series of inoculation hospitals, just like he had done at Marblehead, and inoculate the army. This is considered to be one of Washington's greatest strategic military decisions. Had he not done that, the Continental Army would not have been able to fight the British Army in the field. It would have died from smallpox and the virus. So you inoculate the army and Bond saves it. But as a result, it costs him his life and he dies. He dies pretty much an obscure individual. And until the indispensables, the story had not been told. But that's the reason why I wrote this book. It's about our origin story. It's about our most precious story, which is an incredible story of the founding of this country, of how we, we're so, in many cases, we were so lucky that the revolution was not a failure because in many, many ways, and in many, many times, it would have failed had it not been for the right Americans at the right time, at the right place in history, the indispensables. Thank you very much, and I'll take questions. Thank you, Patrick. You're welcome. <clears throat> I'm always, um, while people think of their questions, I actually have one. Um, 
I'm always interested in what kinds of materials still exist, you know, when you do your research. I imagine, you know, the military stuff that those records are pretty easy to come by, but how do you find out about resurrectionists and, and uh, you know, the, the virus, you know, the, how do you go? There's about all kinds, there were so many, I use thousands of sources. And this book has literally well over a thousand endnotes. Most of it's primary. And it comes from, it's, it's a pointillistic, it's a mosaic of, a Roman mosaic that's been shattered into tens of thousands of pieces. And I'm an archeologist <laughs> piecing this thing together and then trying to tell a story at the same time. And that's what this is. It's a narrative history that is very, um, the Wall Street Journal gave it a rave review. They said it was, um, basically said it was uh, novel-like, which uh, I thought was a great compliment. Yeah. Um, even though it's exceptionally well-researched, the, and there's nothing in it that's, that's embellished or, uh, you know, I've made up the dialogue or anything like that. But the story of the virus comes from a lot of the papers of the time, um, which are very, uh, they really kind of put you there in, 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 into the, 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 the panic of what's going on. It, it gives you this kind of resonance that, of, uh, of what it was like to live through this thing. Um, the letters, the diaries, the pension files, there's, uh, you were lucky enough to go through the American Revolution <laughs> and not die. Um, and then you made it all the way to 1820. And then a little bit further for some cases, another tranche. You go down to the local courthouse and swear under oath what you saw and did. And this is the greatest, this is the great untold or untapped oral history of the American Revolution. Because it's in their own words, some of the foot soldiers of the war. That's what I specialize in. I, I, most of the characters in this book are, are it's Romeo, it's uh, Cuff. It's it's the African African American uh, soldiers, Native American soldiers that have never been heard from by anybody, and there are stories buried in a pension application, and in many cases, in some cases, it's 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 minor stuff. I was at Battle Bunker Hill. Other cases, it's a vivid account of what they saw and did, and these um, oral histories are imbued in the narrative of the indispensables. It's great. It's so often it's hard to find primary materials for Native Americans and for African Americans. So I think that's it was amazing. very hard yeah. <laughs> because many of these individuals, many of these uh, these great heroes, they died in poverty, and that was the that was when you, another thing that you saw that I saw in the pension applications where these these incredible heroes, these African American soldiers in this war, you know, die with with very few personal belongings at all. And they have to list their what they have and own. And, and many of these individuals are dying in poverty. It's really quite sad. And then the resurrectionists, was that an oddball activity or were doctors? Well, I found, I found a letter that, that, that uh, Bond and, and Warren had wrote and they talked about their, their role in something called the Spunker Club, which is the <laughs> resurrectionist club from Harvard. <laughs> And some other, there's other references. So it's really kind of cool. And I'm like, oh, wow, this is neat. This is, this is Hollywood <laughs> stuff, right? You can't make this stuff up. It's so interesting. And then Dr. Church, this, this seemingly ardent patriot who's actually Gage's favorite spy, you know, uh, out there um, feeding General Gage the greatest intelligence of the war. Um, and betraying his fellow Americans in the process. Well, amazing. All right, I'll stop hogging the spotlight. We have some questions here. Um, so let's see. So Georgia and Richard ask, was James Madison wounded in the Battle of Trenton? This is one of my favorite stories in the book. Um, James Madison, our fifth president, is in the Battle of Trenton as a lieutenant. And he is in the van of the attack on Trenton that, that on Christmas night, uh, going into the following day. And they're, they're moving down the river road. And Washington gives orders to the men in the, um, 
in the Vanguard to basically detain any civilians that, that pop out of their houses because, or anybody, because information is key here. If Johan Rall is given information that the Americans are coming, which he was, but they're, they, they're trying their best to detain anybody from informing the British. So everybody is retained and a, a dog is barking in the middle of the night. And one of the residents on, in a home on the river, near the river road comes out because he's wondering why the dog is barking. And Madison informs that individual that he better get back inside. Um, and this, this doctor, Dr. Riker, sees the Continental Army, you know, nearly over 2,400 men strong marching down the road. And he says, I'm a patriot. I'm a doctor. Maybe I can help. Can I join you? And they give Dr. Riker the opportunity to march with the Continentals. And James Madison is involved in an attack on several cannon that, are, that the Hessians have in the heart of Trenton. And Trenton is, is incredible. There's so much history in plain sight in Trenton. Sadly, much of that history is not documented with uh, plaques, et cetera. But the area that the cannons are located is a park. They were located and, and, and Madison charged the cannons. I mean, this is a pure war hero type stuff and they seize the cannons, but, but he's given a, um, a, a wound that is considered mortal. Dr. Riker, the man that pops out to see if his dog is there, saves our fifth president's life that night. And he's, you know, and, 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 we, and we have uh, Dr. Riker to thank for that, you know, extraordinary thing. And then after, the, after that incident, Madison never knew who it was that really saved him until long after the war is over. It's, um, it's interesting how serendipity and things sort of take place. I know sometimes, I mean, you, you refer to your book reading like a novel, but so, I often feel like true life history is more fascinating than what it's you think. It's always way better than any kind of fiction, that's for sure. <laughs> and that's unfortunately what Hollywood doesn't get. <laughs> uh, so we have a question from John. Um, what happened to Dr. Church? Dr. Church story is, uh, he's one of my, I think, I find him the, one of the most fascinating characters in the book. Dr. Church is, is very clever. He, um, you know, after, during the Battle of Lexington and Concord, Dr. Church pretends to treat the wounded. He acts, he even actually pours a little bit of, sprinkles some blood on his socks to make it look like he was in the thick of combat you know, really kind of embellishes his story. And um, after the Battle of Lexington Concord, he, he tells the committee of, of safety, um, which is, well, they're basically the body that's sort of trying to organize things, that he must go to General Gage to not only get medical supplies for the Patriots, but also potentially talk to him. And, you know, what he does is he goes to General Gage, he gets, he gets an escort even into Gage's headquarters and then reveals even more information. But the, the blockade around the city, the lines form around the city, and Dr. Church has, is finding it increasingly difficult to, to relay intelligence to Gage. So he comes up with a cipher code in a series of couriers. And um, his mistress is involved. And one of these cipher code, coded messages um, goes through the mistress and the, and the mistress sort of gives it somehow the ex-husband of the mistress gets involved. <laughs> and it's interesting. Elbridge Gary, main character of the book, is cr cracks the cipher along with uh, some other individuals. And they find out that, that it's military intelligence. Dr. Church is so silver tongued and so persuasive that he makes it sort of opaque. He sort of, he was doing it for a specific reason. It was more, it was a noble reason. And they really don't know what to think, but they jail Dr. Church. And um, Dr. Church is imprisoned and for, for many, many months. And eventually they still don't know what to do with Dr. Church. And they decide to exile him. And Dr. Church is sent off on a ship 
and the ship is uh it's never seen again basically and neither is dr church it's uh lost at sea wow <laughs> <laughs> Um, let's see, were there any stories that you loved, but couldn't include because they were outside the scope of the book? That's an interesting question. Um, th that's one of those things that you always have to be careful as an, as a, as an author, um, to sort of keep the focus on, on, on the group. But what I try to do in all of my books is they're about an untold story for the most part, but it's also a smaller story that tells a larger story. And things that some people might consider a little bit tangential were actually telling that larger story. And I included, I think, a fair amount of things that are that really tell this small story of men and women that are in the great inflection points of history, but also tell the larger story of the Revolutionary War and some degree the revolution itself within, within the Indispensables. Cool, I, um, one thing that fascinates me about history is the way it can feel so um, kind of circular. You know, and it's the 1700s and people are politicizing a virus. And, and that sounds awfully familiar to the last couple of years. Um, so I, I think mean, people will see a lot of uh, things that are uh, what's old is new in many yeah. ways. And you can see different things in this book that are that will resonate with people uh, in many ways. Is I mean Go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, have it. I, I had the same observation as Amy when you're telling the story and you're talking about the virus and inoculation and is it are they going to do it and it becomes very politicized. And I was just wondering, I imagine this book was mostly done. A lot of the research was done before the pandemic. I don't know. And I was just wondering for you, what was it like to observe our society for the last year? It was some of it was done, but then some of it was not. And I felt in some ways that I was reliving what I was writing, in, you know, and, and seeing things. And it was, uh, yeah, it was, it was disturbing, to say the least. And, uh, it, you know, I think that there's a lot of lessons that we can learn from the book. One of the biggest being um, power and how it's dispersed. Elbridge Gary in particular was, was very uh, concerned of a, about a standing army, for instance. He was also very concerned about how a government could potentially control all of their lives. And he was, he's very instrumental in the Bill of Rights, for instance, and he's very concerned about all of these things. His, his, um, he takes abstract concepts such as republicanism, and I mean that with a small r, which is sort of virtue above yourself for the greater good in many ways. A lot of these concepts he tries to translate into things and live them. And uh, I think there's a lot of things, especially with the concentration of power, for instance, in technology or technology companies that, that can control a narrative or control our lives. I mean, there's a lot of things that are, that are quickly changing. And I think that the um, founders understood power and they understood how to diffuse it and disperse it so they wouldn't be concentrated in the hands of a few. There's, um, as you were telling the story, I was thinking about all the layers that go into tell and the details that go into telling this one story. And there's a million stories to be told. And I'm just wondering as a historian, when do you get to a point where you say, okay, this could be a book, this is worth pursuing the entire line? Yeah, all of the things uh, I ask, all the, all the books I've ever written have found me. And I mean that like the sign, for instance, I've, I'm writing a book on the Civil War now and I'm just, well, I'm just riding around the area and I find, I found a sign and I'm like, well, that's really interesting. You know, what, what's that all about? It's all about, for me, it's about curiosity. I wanna know more. And it's all about sort of the backstory. And then when I find out that a small story 
can relate to something much larger. In many cases, it's, um, it answers the question of who cares. Like, for instance, why does it matter that I wrote this book? Well, <laughs> we wouldn't be here had it not been for, for these individuals in, in, in so many inflection points during the revolution. Dr. Bond or the, the crossing of the Delaware or the, the American Dunkirk or the gunpowder. I mean, just endless things. Um, I, I like things that, that, ha that, that matter, um, but also are a good story and they're untold story in many ways. Um, that's very important to me too. And then I just find it interesting, the, the journey is always more interesting to me than the, the writing itself. I love the journey of the research. I always walk the areas that I write about. I go to their homes, go to the battlefields, uh, I go to their graves. I go everywhere that I can, that has a link. I'm looking, I always, I even collect artifacts or, or ephemera uh, that relate to the books I write. Because I love to have, to be able to hold something in my hand that is a, that a connection to the past. I find that to be really, ex, you know, kind of extraordinary. What do you have for, for the book, The Indispensables for uh, a collection? Right now, I just have Dr. Bond's letter, and um, I have a piece of a ship that um, there's a small connection, but really, other than that, not much. It's it's really uh, unlike the Civil War or World War II. It's it's really hard to to come upon some sort of an original artifact that relates to the Revolution. But I'm always looking. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we look forward to your book about the Civil War, but, you know, no rush. You just published this one. <laughs> um, I don't see any more questions. So I just would like to say thank you for sharing your time with us tonight. And it's, oh, been it's great. I really enjoyed it very much. Good. And um, maybe next time we can get you on the island to talk. In I would love that. It's <laughs> uh, one thing to do these Zoom meetings, but it's more fun to be there and you know and in, in the area and just meeting people and everything else yeah all right all right wonderful thank you so much for having me thank you thanks, patrick lots of love in the chat everyone saying thank you